Welcome to all of you. Again, we're so glad that you're here. Julia and I show up each and every day to have these thoughtful conversations, insightful conversations. And today we are really excited to have another Nonprofit Power Week episode with Ide Bailey. And we're talking with Kyle Hendrickson today all about cybersecurity insurance realities. And for those of you that have joined us earlier in this week, uh, we launched the the Power Week on Monday with Kyle in person, live in studio uh, in the Phoenix office for Ide Bailey. Yesterday, we um, had another very insightful conversation, but Kyle's here to talk to us about the cybersecurity insurance. And again, I didn't even know this was a thing. So I am definitely learning as we go with the nonprofit Power Week. So as we jump into today's conversation, we want to remind you who our voices and faces are that you're seeing and hearing. Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. I'm Jarrett Ransom, Julia's personal nonprofit nerd, but I can be your personal nonprofit nerd too, CEO of the Raven Group. And we are always so very honored to have the continued support and trust from our very invested presenting sponsors. So thank you to Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, Be Generous, your part-time controller, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and The Nonprofit Nerd. These companies, many have been with us from the very, very beginning, March of 2020, and have helped us produce over 700 broadcasts. So thrilled to have their support. And if you missed any of those broadcasts, you know where to find us, Roku, YouTube, Amazon Fire TV, as well as Vimeo. And for those of you who are podcast listeners, you can go ahead and queue us up there wherever you stream your podcast. So again, Kyle Hendrickson is back. We haven't scared him. He hasn't scared us. And we're here to talk uh, more, dive deeper in cybersecurity. So welcome back, Kyle. Thank you. And, and speaking of being scared, so um, full disclosure, um, right before this episode, I ate a bunch of Oreos. And so I was actually more scared of having everything in my teeth than I was of talking about cybersecurity insurance. I, I have a question. Are they the Halloween Oreos with the yeah. orange filling? Or are they the regular with the cream fi- or white filling? Double stuffed regular. Okay. And do you turn them and lick them? Like th- now you're really getting into like the detail. <laughs> I uh, I mostly just shove them in two at a time as fast as I can <laughs> yeah. because I love them. Yeah, they they are pretty tasty. Well, we love getting to know more about you because, you know, cybersecurity is not a light subject. It's really scary in and of itself. And you have helped us to really understand this in layman's terms. So I want to say thank you for that. Um, and again, we're going to dive into, you know, what is it we need for cybersecurity insurance for our nonprofit friends across the country? So, you know, Kyle, um, one of the things that Jarrett and I were like, oh, I don't know if we can have a whole week with somebody who's, you know, in in the cyber world, he's probably not going to be very aligned to the nonprofit world yeah. and understand what we all do. Or fun, I, like or, Yawn Fest. <laughs> or fun. Okay, I didn't want to go there, but thank you. And so we learned... Um, at lunch with you earlier in the week, off camera, of course, that you know about the nonprofit sector. Will you share with us the amazing story about starting your own nonprofit? Yeah, so starting uh, in the fall of 2020, uh, when our girls were going back to uh, high school at that time, and everything turned into a learn from home situation, we realized very quickly that they were taken care of on technology. They they had everything they needed with a dad having access to plenty of computers, <laughs> but their friends and their buddies at school uh, weren't in that situation. There were a lot of kids in our area that were left out, even with school provided devices. They just didn't necessarily have everything that they needed to be set up for success in a all remote environment. And so we took the retired computers out of uh, where I worked and we, re- we were on a three-year replacement cycle. So they're all good computers still uh, able to do anything they needed to do. Uh, me and my wife, uh, we cleaned them up, we got them ready, we fixed what needed to be fixing, and and we were able to give them away. 
and, and no questions asked, um, just took care of people. And whether it was uh, kids, uh, whether it was uh, parents, now suddenly working from home and needing to do that, uh, veterans, people going back to college, um, we just found a lot of need in our community and the surrounding communities. And, and it just, it felt really good to be able to help out. It's fantastic to hear that. You know, um, I myself, very fortunate. My my son's dad works for very large computer companies. And I joke, I'm like, my 12-year-old has more computers than I ever have in my entire life. Um, and again, we had talked about earlier in, in these episodes, you know, our children and other individuals are learning so much about technology and the acceleration through COVID. Um, and I commend you and your wife for that, because we also learned it's not just in the Dakotas, you're sending this across the country to other individuals. And I didn't know it was adults as well. So that's really, really amazing. No questions asked. Wherever someone has found a, a need, um, we've just stepped in, um, not worrying about uh, exactly everybody's personal situation. If they come to us, obviously they, they, need, they need help and, and we're able to just provide help where we can. And it's been a really fun adventure. That's really and tell good. us the name of your nonprofit. Uh, Green Dog Tech. Green Dog Tech. All right. Yep. Well, we love it. Um, I, I think that um, I've heard about this very interesting competition of sorts, the Resourcefulness Awards presented by I Bailey. Hmm. There might be something there. But yeah, I love it. I'm really proud of you. I think it's cool. And, you know, Jared and I are very fortunate. We get to hear these amazing stories from founders day in and day out, and um, it's really powerful. And it's something that uh, is just an amazing thing to witness. So congratulations. And how many uh, devices have you worked with so far? Uh, so the first year we were right around 500. Um, so that that 2020, <laughs> finishing out 2020 in the fall, we were able to do about 500. Uh, this year, we're on target for about 3,500 devices to either sell or, or place to people in need. Um, Holy smokes. And yeah. you're doing this out of your like garage or your home or something? Yeah, garage and home. So yes, uh, my wife is awesome. <laughs> I love it. Shout well, out to her. Absolutely. Yeah, this is really cool. And And so now if you ever needed to think, wow, does this techie dude can he really understand my nonprofit pain yes he can so <laughs> i am excited so let's let's get into this kyle who to cyber to cyber security insurance is that something we need or can we wait i mean talk to us about this yeah so again i'm going to use a made-up word cyber risk and <laughs> I don't know that cyber risk really is a thing, but cyber risk really is business risk. So insurance is there to help us mitigate risk to all of our businesses. And so specifically, we're talking about how do we um, help ensure that our nonprofits are able to survive a disaster around a cybersecurity incident. So yes, I believe that cybersecurity insurance is a requirement for nearly any business that I talk to, nonprofit or otherwise. This is just about business risk management. That is so fascinating yeah. to me because before Monday, I didn't even know cybersecurity insurance was a thing. Um, and one of the insurance we talk about often is wow. directors and officers insurance. And we really wave that flag a lot. So I'm curious, is cybersecurity included in DNO insurance? And is it an add-on or is it a separate policy? So this is typically a separate policy. This would be sometimes combined with uh, uh, business um, outage type insurance or uh, errors and omissions type of insurance. Uh, sometimes it's additive to that, but typically cybersecurity insurance is, is its own separate policy with its own um, analysts and adjusters and, and making sure that they're sizing things appropriately for the size of your organization. Okay. And does it vary by sector? And we, we always think of the nonprofit sector as having you know, nine major subsets. Let's say you're running a museum or a cultural institution. Is that cybersecurity policy going to differ from like that of maybe somebody in healthcare or human services? 
Yeah. So it, it depends on what we're trying to protect. So mm-hmm. some of us are trying to protect monetary assets. Some of us are trying to protect um personal health information. Some of us are looking at just private information for donors or those people that we're serving. So it's going to depend on the type and amount of personal information or the kind of information we're trying to protect, along with the size and complexity of our organization. So if I'm a tiny organization, I have less things to protect than a large health system that may be a nonprofit. And so I'm going to have less as far as premiums, less as far as coverage, but it's, it's, it's going to impact me less on the bottom line. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a, a great way to look at it because it can kind of kind of help you shop the market so to speak or to understand why if you talk to a counterpart but they're in a different sector their their insurance costs might be quite a bit different so yeah, yeah that, that's really interesting talk to us a little bit about you know along that line and understanding that we need to have this policy and jared i loved your question this is a separate type of insurance, so it's not just going to come under your general business umbrella coverage. What are some of the challenges to renewing? This isn't just going to be something that you get in the mail and you check the box or you send the check, right? Uh, not quite. Um, there are some requirements. Uh, so a little bit of history here. So. Starting around five, six years ago, this used to be a check the box type situation where you could just, hey, do you want to add this to whatever policy you have going on? And insurance brokers would just include it. Carriers would cover you. It was just a thing that you added to your policies. Mm -hmm. Starting about four-ish years ago, uh, ransomware became big in the news, and we started hearing about that in the headlines all around us, in our communities, everywhere. That took the insurance uh, industry a little bit by surprise. And so suddenly they had to pay out on a ton of claims as a result of ransomware and as a result of these large breaches or extortion attempts from ransomware actors. Um Insurance companies make money when they don't have to pay out claims. Yeah. And so they have actuaries. They have really, really smart people that can look at all the bad things that they've had to pay out on claims in the past to know what are the key things that need to be in place so that they can keep making money and keep serving their shareholders. And so now it's not just a guarantee that you're going to get your renewal or a policy in the first place. They're looking for key things in your environment. And so, uh, yeah, I'm referencing uh, something from one of the largest uh, cybersecurity insurance brokers in the United States when I say they're looking for key five or five key controls. And then above and beyond those key five controls, they're looking for how comprehensive is your protections that you have in place that lines up with their best practices to understand how big of a risk are you gonna be to them. And so the better your cybersecurity program, Mm -hmm. including those required items, the less your premium is gonna be and the easier time that you're gonna have for renewals. And this is for any size. And I love that you really do say business, you know, and I just want to remind everyone nonprofits are businesses and we need to, you know, stay in that mindset, but this is for any size business. Is that correct, Kyle? Yep. Yeah. So this is uh, from small to big, whether it's for profit or nonprofit, we all have the same requirements being placed upon us by both the cybersecurity brokers and the cybersecurity insurance carriers. Okay, so I got to ask, I mean, this is like kind of a left field question, but in the past, you know, you could even today go online and and pretty much within a few minutes be fully covered on whatever it is you're looking for. I would imagine going into the marketplace, which is probably still somewhat limited. This isn't going to be a quick go online and you're covered in 15 minutes kind of purchase, right? Not typically. So you're going to be wanting to work with a broker. Uh, that shops multiple carriers and is going to tell your story or help you tell your story around where you're at in your cybersecurity journey and make sure that you're as accurately portrayed to the carriers that they work with as possible and understanding what is that risk 
that you pose to them by uh, them extending insurance to you. I'm curious, Kyle, has any of this changed over the last three years with a lot of remote working now? You know, like there's a lot of um, Question. Gosh, you know, staff working remotely, mm-hmm. but a lot of systems that have been integrated. Has the cybersecurity insurance and the policies, you know, some of the requirements, have those changed, you think, because of a lot of the increase of remote working? So I don't know that answer, but I do know that when we start looking at those five required controls that need to be in place, things like multi-factor authentication, uh, endpoint uh, detection and response, so the next version of antivirus, uh, gen, next-gen antivirus, um, secure and encrypted and, and isolated backups, uh, making sure you're, priv- you're managing your administrative priv- privileges across all of your computers, and then implementing email filtering and web security. These are all centered around things that would affect us in a remote work environment. So the challenge to an organization as we're in a hybrid or a fully remote work environment is, when we're talking about cybersecurity controls, how are you making sure that you're effectively implementing all these things across all of your computers, regardless of where they're at? We want to be comprehensive and holistic and manage risk across our entire organization, not just when they're on site and in our office. Yeah. Okay. So I, this, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I have to admit that two factor, you know, um, authentication, it's a really hard word for me to say, (laughs) it's annoying as heck, but I understand the need of it. But oftentimes what I find is, you know, I'm working with a client because I'm a consultant, but working with, you know, so many other people, it's like, well, where did this go? Who, you know, and is the staff still there? Um, And so there's a lot of kind of nuance in that. And it's an easy thing to just kind of turn off and say, we're not going to worry about that. But are you telling me we, we need to worry about that? We need multi-factor authentication (laughs) everywhere and for everybody. Um, But when we start talking about multi-factor authentication, we should be looking towards solutions that we can use that we can integrate in with a common multi-factor authentication platform where we have one way for doing that challenge response that's something that we have and making sure that it is legitimate so we don't uh, have 14 different things that we're using for multi-factor and making it even harder to manage and when we get down onto one platform, then we have the ability to start creating custom rules like, do I know this device? Um, is there uh, a location specific attribute that I can tie this to somewhere that is connected before with that trusted device? Is it within the normal working hours that I normally work? Are all these things um, that are true enabling us to make risk-based decisions that maybe I don't need to be doing that challenge every single thing, every single time I check my email. Got it. How, that how makes we, my life a little easier. <laughs> reducing the friction of cybersecurity. Yeah. We want to be comprehensive and make it even better, but then make it less painful to use everywhere. Sounds you know, scary. Kyle, this is like one of those things that it like, I if I didn't know about Green Dog Tech, I probably wouldn't have thought about this, but I hear you saying, you know, with this work from anywhere concept and all of these different devices that we have in the past, we would share our devices with our family members. Mm -hmm. So it sounds to me like in the nonprofit sector and in in probably, you know, in the the for-profit sector, of course, as well, that we need to start investing in dedicated devices that are not being shared. Is that, would that be an accurate thing to help reduce some of that risk? Well, so I would always recommend anything that is doing anything financial for your nonprofit uh, be completely separate from anything the rest of your family is using for non-business purposes. So that's the first step. And then from there, as we can, knowing that some nonprofits are small and and working with very little means, from there, then I would separate out business activities from personal activities. So if we can... um, isolate that and and make it so we have dedicated devices just to support the nonprofit knowing that our personal life blends over sometimes i'm not so in, i'm not so worried about a individual that works on the nonprofit's behalf that also does some personal on the same device 
I would be more interested in making sure other family members are not getting on that business device to do whatever they need to do in a personal setting. Smart. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's why. No, this is a curveball, and I don't know if you're going to know the answer, Kyle, <laughs> but you've been with us now three days. And I'm curious if these uh, cyber insur- security insurance policies if they also cover board members and volunteers, because as I think of, you know, committee uh, members and they're working in the donor database, are we covering them in these policies? Yes. So we're going to be covering anybody who's working on behalf of the organization. And we just need to be clear with our, when we're getting that policy, that this is our world of who accesses this data and this okay. is who needs to be covered. So yeah, that's that's all part of this. Good. I just had a bit of a panic because I know it's event season right now and events are typically, you know, uh, heavy, heavy dependent on um, some amazing volunteers and event committee members. So I wanted to see about that. I love that you asked that question because yeah, absolutely, Jared. I hadn't thought of it in that quite in that perspective, but yeah, absolutely. Well, of course now you're gonna, as we, as we look forward and I love that you're like, we can bring messages of hope. I'm gonna ask you to kind of walk us through, take, don't let your hair on fire go any further. You don't have to be burning it all off. Messages of hope, actions to reduce risk. What does that mean? And and are these achievable for us? So I kind of cheated. I already gave you the answers to the test here. So <laughs> again, I'm going to look back at those five required controls yeah, the because controls. The, the insurance carriers know that these are the things that need to be in place and done well okay. so that they don't have to pay claims. That directly translates into less risk for all of our organizations. So again, those five required controls are gonna be centered around multi-factor authentication, next-gen antivirus, EDR is what we call that now, secure, tested, and isolated backups. So when things like ransomware take a hold, you, their threat actors typically will try and disrupt your backups so that they can force you into a payment situation. So we need to protect them. Okay. We need to make sure that we're properly managing administrative rights, both to our computers and to the systems that we're using to support everyone we need to support. Mm-hmm. And then we need to implement email filtering and web security. Now, and that's just things, the minimum. That's <laughs> just the minimum, bare minimum. One yeah. of the things I know to be true for so many of our of our friends is you know, the person that's in charge of IT is literally the person that knows how to plug in the right wires into the right sockets, right? Right. So who should be overseeing cybersecurity? And is that, is it a staff position? Is it, you know, a partner like I Bailey? Where does this sit? Yeah, So question. I think that the questions should be asked of the leaders within the organization. So that might be uh, on the board. Okay. How is management taking care of this? And it isn't necessarily that management within the organization is doing it, but they may have a partner like I Bailey or another partner that can assist them with both implementing these controls and then the ongoing monitoring and maintenance of things. Um, but I would, I would expect that from a leadership perspective that the board or the founder or executive leadership committee, just like within a business, the people that are tasked with keeping that business successful should be asking these questions because again, this is business risk. And then is the policy a year? Do we renew it annually or is it a multi-year policy? It's typically a one-year policy and the the guidance I would give people is talk to your broker early and often to know what's going to be coming for next year's renewal. So if the things have changed, you have time to plan to make sure you won't have a lapse in coverage. Because again, this is helping manage business risk. 
That's exactly what I'm thinking. And so, you know, Julia, you always um, share a lot about that leadership list, you know, quarterly updating your, your fast facts, things like this. Like I feel the cybersecurity insurance has got to go on this quarterly list because with the acceleration of technology, the access to technology across the globe, there's just so many new nuances within the, the technology realm. Yeah, it's a changing landscape. And and because of that, I would imagine that um, the insurance companies are changing their parameters all the time. And then to Kyle's point, finding uh, new avenues of extortion, ransomware, all of these different um, attack and threat positions, it's it's a changing target. I thought it was interesting, Kyle, that you mentioned tonight, and I'd love, we don't have that much time, but I'd love for you to kind of amplify that point of renewal and that we need to be looking out i mean 12 months goes by like that what does that look like if we're trying to plan and put this on our calendars to start moving forward on regaining that i mean i don't think we can just rely on our insurance brokers to call us up and say okay we need to start planning and we need to be ahead of this as well well, and so this doesn't need to be something that is a, a week-long event with your insurance broker, okay. but asking them what frequency that you need to be working with them and touching base to see if anything has changed. And for a lot of people, that means either uh, at six months out or quarterly. So okay. understanding, um, okay, just a, just a quick 15 minute or a half an hour touch base and make sure that, okay, this is what we've accomplished over the last year in improving things. Does this line up with what we would expect? And then asking the question, are there things that we can do that would potentially reduce our premiums? Because there is. If the better the program, the less risk you are to the carriers. And so that should be reflected in your premiums. So asking those questions and making sure that you have a broker that you can work with and establishing a frequency that works for both of you, knowing that this doesn't need to be a ton of time invested in checking in, just making sure that you're you're keeping a finger on the pulse. Mm -hmm. Great advice. And again, continued messages of hope. Uh, day three with Kyle Hendrickson as we talk about cybersecurity. And again, so grateful that Ied Bailey has the foresight to include this in their services. This entire week is dedicated uh, to the nonprofit Power Week again with Ied Bailey. You can find all of these episodes that we've had with Kyle starting on Monday with our live and audience um, episode. You know, cybersecurity, again, as we said, It can be frightening, but Kyle is here to deliver each and every day this week some messages of hope. And speaking of questions, if you have questions, send them to us. Friday, also referred to as Friday, Kyle and I uh, will dedicate that entire episode for Ied Bailey and these cybersecurity questions that you, our viewers, and our listeners might have and might want to ask. So make sure you send those over to us. Yeah, it's going to be really great, a lot of fun, and I think um, a lot of opportunity. Again, Kyle Hendrickson, Director of Cybersecurity for Ied Bailey. Um, What a a great way for us to get a better grip on this concept. It's not an easy topic for a lot of us in the nonprofit sector. It's a new concept and yet um, incredibly perilous if we don't know about it. So, Kyle, thanks to talking with us and spending so much time on this deep dive. If you go to iBailey.com, there's quite an extensive uh, selection of information about cybersecurity. Many of the things that Kyle has been going over, uh, you can access that. You don't have to be a client of iBailey. You can get that free information, a lot of resources, and you can even learn more about uh, Kyle Hendrickson on that. Again, I'm Julia Patrick. I've been joined today by the nonprofit nerd herself, Jarrett Ransom which has the perfect name for (laughs) this week of cybersecurity. I don't know if I do. I think it's a horrible name this week. (laughs) I don't know. I think it like is just serendipitous. I actually have (laughs) loved that. But uh, yeah, it's been really a lot of fun to have Jared on this road with us. And again, we want to thank all of our sponsors who continue to join us in these conversations. Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Be Generous, 
Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and the Nonprofit Nerd. These are the folks that join us day in and day out. Hey, everybody, as we like to end every episode of the Nonprofit Show, we want to remind ourselves, our viewers, our listeners, even our guests, stay well so you can do well. Thanks, gang. We'll see you back here tomorrow.